Philadelphia, May 10th, 1876. It's finally here, the opening day of the Centennial Exposition. Celebrating the 100th anniversary of U.S. independence, this is the first World's Fair held on the American continent. And in front of the crowd stands a behemoth symbol of the modern age, a Corliss steam engine to power the Exposition Hall's wondrous machines. Then, two men step forward to stoke the huge double cylinders to life. The first is President Ulysses S. Grant, leader of the Hemisphere's First Republic, and the other is Emperor Pedro II, the only monarch in the Americas. Prosperous and stable, Brazil has gained international respect as a second great American power. It recently arbitrated a dispute between the U.S. and U.K., and its pavilion is among the grandest at this event. The two men throw the switches, the engine chugs to life, and the Philadelphia crowd erupts with applause. But back home in Brazil, people are no longer cheering for Pedro II. Thanks so much to Fabulous for helping us present today's historical tale. We last left the Empire of Brazil in 1865, a time when its power was unquestioned. It was economically strong, politically secure, building infrastructure, producing art, and taking gradual steps toward the abolition of slavery. And this is how people of today often remember the empire, as a bastion of order in the chaotic world of 19th century South American republics. However, by now you've probably realized how illusionary that outward strength was. Brazil's many fault lines, from slavery to questions about political centralization and the legitimacy of the monarchy, hadn't been solved, they'd just calmed down. But a big event was about to bring them to the forefront. Brazil possessed the largest army in South America, and during Pedro's reign, it had been successful in two regional wars, toppling an unfriendly Argentine dictator in 1851 and intervening in Uruguay's civil war in 1864. It even triumphed in a diplomatic standoff with Britain all victories that came quickly and easily. But due to Brazil's intervention in Uruguay, tensions flared with neighboring Paraguay. Now, the Paraguayan War is complex and its causes are disputed, but to put it in very simple terms, it was a war over river access and disputed territorial claims dating back to colonial times. And after a diplomatic impasse, the much smaller Paraguay attacked Brazil. Forming a triple alliance with Argentina and Uruguay, Brazil felt confident it would secure victory within months. Instead, it took three years to destroy Paraguay's conventional military and sack its capital. Even then, fighting continued for two more years in a relentless guerrilla conflict that became the bloodiest war ever fought in South America. Paraguay lost a large percentage of its population, how much exactly is still hotly debated, and Brazil lost around 50,000 soldiers, including whole military units. The violence was astounding. During those five years, the Brazilian government found it could do nothing but manage the war. Domestic issues fell by the wayside, and the war started to change whatever it touched. Some of these changes were positives for the government. The Paraguayan War whipped up the sort of unifying nationalism that Pedro II had worked hard to foster, making several of its generals and officers patriotic heroes. But there was a downside to that. For instance, previously, Pedro had been the unifying national figure. Heck, the green and yellow of the national flag were Bergunza colors. Now, he had competition. Not to mention, the war brought the army into the center of government and public life in a new way. Before, it was just a thing called up and used in conflicts, but now it was a respected institution. Yet the biggest impact was on slavery. See, a few years into the war, the government was so desperate for troops that it started drafting men into service. But rich men could send a slave instead. And since only free men could join the army, any slave fighting in the war was legally freed. In fact, by the end of the war, the empire was flat out impressing slaves into the military and paying their owners compensation. And these newly freed soldiers were no longer fighting in segregated all-black units, but in a radically integrated army that was largely people of color. This lit a fire under Brazil's abolition movement. After all, these men were heroes of the empire, and when the war ended in an alliance victory in 1870, they returned to a country where their families were still shackled and whipped, where they were in danger of being re-enslaved, and where they couldn't vote because they weren't born free. This was unacceptable to much of the public, including white Brazilians who'd served alongside freedmen in their ranks. It also came as the economics of slavery were shifting, with the largest number of slaves being centered in the southern coffee-producing regions rather than being more equally distributed. Yet the Brazilian legislature slow-walked it. In 1871, they passed the Free Womb Law, freeing all children born to enslaved women. In 1884 came a law freeing enslaved people over the age of 60, though many did not live that long. 
And though Pedro said he was privately an abolitionist, he consistently refused to use his power to do anything to support abolition. In fact, he mostly wasn't even there. Because Pedro had caught the travel bug. When the law of free birth had been ratified, he'd been touring Europe and North America, ostensibly to see his daughter's grave in Germany, but with plenty of recreational trips tacked on. In 1876, he went to the Centennial Exposition, then onto both coasts of the USA, Canada, Northern Europe, Russia, the Mediterranean, the Ottoman Empire, the Middle East, then Europe again. He was gone a year and a half. Now, these trips went down great in the places he visited, but not so at home. Because remember, the 1824 Constitution made the emperor no mere figurehead, but a sort of presidential monarch, meaning he had duties. But Pedro II had always resented being emperor, and now that he saw the world that he'd missed out on as a result, he was even angrier. He also only had daughters, and though the Constitution said women could inherit the throne, he believed that the country wouldn't accept a queen. The institution was, in his mind, doomed. So he just stopped caring. Before, he'd been studious about his ceremonial role at least, but now he wasn't even putting in that effort. This made the people furious. Before the war, he was seen as an enlightened scholar monarch, but now he was just some man who'd presided over five years of economically costly slaughter and couldn't be bothered to stay in the country he ruled. Republican parties, openly calling for the monarchy to be abolished and replaced with a republic like that of the United States, started flourishing. Though Pedro did finally do one thing. In 1887, he privately backed a legislative move on abolition, then he sailed off to Europe for medical treatment. On May 13, 1888, it was Pedro's daughter Isabel who read the freshly ratified Golden Act from the balcony of the palace, a law freeing the remaining 700,000 people still enslaved in Brazil and abolishing the institution. Though it came far too late and only completed a process long in coming, this catalyzed the opposition. Rural plantation owners, infuriated by the Golden Act, threw their weight behind the Republicans as a form of revenge, and this combined faction lobbied several generals to stage a coup. Army leaders, angry about being devalued after the war as well as limits on their political speech, assented. When the coup came on November 15th, 1889, it was a tawdry thing. Most citizens of Rio thought the troops marching toward the palace were part of a parade. Many, including the marshal leading them, thought they'd just arrest the prime minister. They went much farther. And by afternoon, they'd captured the government and declared a republic. Pedro II, true to form, wasn't there, staying at an imperial complex 40 miles away. When he returned, thinking at worst he'd lost a prime minister and some power, he was informed that A, the country was now the United States of Brazil, and B, his family would be sent into exile. And what was his response to this, you may ask? If it is so, it will be my retirement. I have worked too hard, and I am tired. I will go rest then. And early next morning, they hustled him onto a boat, not even allowing him to stop and hear mass first. The empire had begun when Pedro's grandfather boarded a ship and fled Lisbon for Brazil, and now it ended as he himself, surrounded by his most loyal courtiers, left Rio for exile in Europe. He'd die two years later in a Paris hotel. Though the empire only lasted 67 years, a single lifetime, it was the most transformative period in Brazilian history. From a backwater colony with an economy based on slavery, a new nation had emerged. One that was modern and industrial, cosmopolitan and united, artistically vibrant, diverse, and free. A nation that still shapes the region today. See you next time, everyone. We did it, Zoe! Another EH series in the can. High five! You know, before we hop into our next patron-selected series on the history of beer, I really want to double down on locking in some healthy habits. You know, to counteract all that upcoming research. Thankfully, forming healthy habits is precisely what this week's sponsor, Fabulous, aims to do. For the uninitiated, Fabulous is the award-winning self-development app to help you build better habits and achieve your goals. How's an app supposed to do that, you ask? Well, for starters, Fabulous is based on decades of behavioral science research under the patronage of Professor Dan Ariely of Duke University, breaking down proven healthy habits into small tasks that you can easily achieve every single day. Case in point, to get your brain wired into the habit-forming mindset, it begins with asking you to repeat something simple each morning, like drink a glass of water. Then over time, as you get more accustomed to forming new habits, it asks you to add additional tiny healthy tasks to that routine at your own pace, quite literally getting you into the long-lasting habit of forming good habits. 
Not to mention, it's loaded with other features like daily coaching to develop your motivation, a wellness exercise library, and its aesthetic is kinda like Journey and Monument Valley had a helpful baby, meaning it's always nice to look at. So if you'd like a hand in building your ideal science-based daily routine, click the link in the description below. And the first 100 people who do will get 25% off a fabulous subscription and of course be helping out our channel at the same time. As always, thanks so much for that. The biggest EC thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Angela Valenciana, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Margatroyd, and Orioles1 for being fantastic legendary patrons.